sadhana. Spiritual sadhana that is meant to purify your system of desires and regain the state of fulfillment, the fullness that is already there within you. So, the sadhana is twofold, external and internal. External sadhana we saw yesterday, and how this happens is, a brief recap for those of you who were not present yesterday, we go through three transactions of life, receipt, reaction, response. The world enters us by way of stimuli through the five sense organs, organs of perception. Having entered you, they react with the desires in your mind and intellect, and so there is a reaction. As a result of this reaction, there are responses back into the world. Now, the two distinct types of sadhanas, external and internal, are meant for extroverted people, people with a lot of desires for the external, and internal sadhana for people with very few desires. So what happens is, the world enters you if you have too many desires, you're reacting to almost every stimulus that enters you, and therefore you're responding to all the, almost all the stimuli. So the bulk of your personality is geared towards response. This is external. Internal is where, since you don't have that many desires, what happens is the stimuli enter you, there is no reaction, they die inside of you. They just come to an end. There is very little reaction, very little response. So in such a person with very few desires, the bulk of his personality hinges on receipts. So the same karma yoga, bhakti yoga and jnana yoga are highly refined very subtle. So let's say when a person doing internal sadhana needs to do karma, he performs subtle action. Subtle action is initially when you decide to go and do service and uh, do yajna, sacrificial actions, you think of donating money, you think of um, uh, digging wells for the poor, you think of uh, starting homes for and hospitals and schools and things like that. But when you do internal sadhana, you realize that the only way of doing service, real service to people, is to communicate these values of life. We have a real life example of one gentleman, Nishit Bhai is his name. He comes once a month almost and uh, takes books, CDs, cassettes, anything that he can lay his hands on, and packs them in cartons and takes them away. So one day I asked him, I said, what do you do with these things? He says, you know, I run a business, and I have to deal with various kinds of people, excise, sales tax, this, that, and the other, customers. Instead of giving them bribes, instead of taking them out to dinner, Instead of, even when I have to do service, instead of giving them food and things like that, I just give them Vedantic knowledge. So he takes the books that are displayed outside, the CDs that are there, DVDs, VCDs, etc., and distributes them. What service? You know, th this is subtle service. At the highest level, like Sant Tukaram said, Gyavi Maji Seva Bhava Shuddha. What a fine thought. At the highest level, your seva is just in giving fine thoughts. Your bhavana, your devotion, your purity of heart is what you offer at the feet of the Lord. You're not performing any actions, but you're giving the purest of thoughts, the purest of feelings as your contribution to the world and to the Lord. Bhakti yoga, at the subtle level, is just feeling deeply. No longer are you going and listening to bhajans and classical music. And You know, why I'm talking about music is because bhajans and music 
have an incredible capacity to bring out the finest emotions in, in you. So instead of doing that, all that the person does is imbibes fine feelings, entertains fine feelings. He doesn't need anything beyond that. He doesn't need to sing, he doesn't need to go on a pilgrimage, he doesn't need to actually see uh, an image of the Lord. He sees it everywhere. You know, in, the, in Vedanta, there's supposed to be four stages of liberation, four stages of gaining mukti. And these four stages are called Salokyam, Samipyam, Sarupyam, and the last, Sayujya. The brilliant thought. It's so true. Uh, say, for instance, uh, your daughter has gone to the United States and is studying there. In those days, uh, 20, 25 years ago, I remember when my brothers went, they went, they didn't come once in six months like children do here. They came after they finished their uh, education. And even phone calls were restricted to three minutes every month because the call rates were very high, very expensive. So the parents would wait for their child, daughter or son to come back. And in those days, a lot of the flights were via Delhi. So when the flight came, took off from New York, the fact that the flight had taken off from New York gave the parents a great kick. He's already on his way. And then the flight lands in Delhi. Salokyam, he's in the same country, the same vicinity. That gives another kick. And then the plane lands in Bombay. You can't see him, you can't, do, you can't see her. But the fact that it has landed, it's announced, and you see it on the panel, that, that gives another kick. Then she appears in the distance, you're able to recognize her. Sarupyam. You just see her form. And very often, you just see some form there. You think it's your daughter, you get highly excited, it turns out to be someone else. And she, finally she comes out and you give her a nice tight hug. That is Sayujyam, the final union. The movement of a bhakta is exactly like that. Inisha, or any spiritual person for that matter, not necessarily bhakta. It could be karma yogi, bhakta, or jnani. The fact that you've turned introvert, that you have shifted away from external pursuit to looking within for happiness, itself gives you a certain amount of peace, relief. That is called salokyam, you're in the same realm. Next, you be, as you become more and more unselfish and purify yourself of desires and vasanas and all the negativities, demonic traits go down in you, divine traits go up in you. You actually begin to feel, uh, you are capable of perceiving the presence of this divine hand everywhere. You look at a sunrise and you get thrilled. You see the moon and the, it, it sends a chill down your spine. You see the diversity, the beauty in nature, and you're inspired by the thought that there is a divine force operating in the world. And everything that happens to you, you see this benevolent force at work. This is Samipyam. Then Sarupyam. Sarupyam is, you, you go that one step further, and you're actually able to see the divine. You see, when you and I look at the world, you see diversity, you see negativity, you see all kinds of things. Whatever happens in the world, pleasant, unpleasant, joyous, sorrowful, you view it as nothing but God's leela. God is at work. And you're able to turn even the most negative things into positive things. This is called sarupyam. And finally, you get to the state of sayujyam. You reach the state of realization. So, this is a bhakta, subtle bhakti at work. Then, 
Jnana Yoga. Jnana Yoga is not mastery of the scriptures. You know, most people at the, be, in the beginning are only concerned with mastery of the scriptures. Oh, a lot of people come and say, um, you know, I've covered chapters 2 to 8 and then 12 and 13, and these five chapters are the only chapters that are left. Once I finish these five chapters, then I'm finished. You know why you're finished? Because you believe that you know everything. So, that's not what it is. A true jnani is one who is able to focus on that permanent power, that divine power that enables all your activities to take place. In the Kenopanishad, the student goes to the teacher, the guru, and asks, Incidentally, all the Upanishads are not named after the author, the guru. They are named after, many of them, the first word of the Upanishad. So Kena Upanishad has come about because it starts with the word Kena. So the student asks the question, Kena shitam patati preshitam manaha kena prana prathama praiti yuktaha, so on and so forth. It's a technical uh, language, but in short, he's asking, where is God? How is God? How do I get to God? What is the definition and location of God? To which the Guru's answer in the second mantra of the Kenopanishad is par excellence. He simply says, incidentally, he doesn't use a single word that is unknown to anyone. Even a child can understand. But to interpret it and truly integrate it into your system is a different thing. So he says, Shrutrasya Shrutra, Manaso Mano, Yat Vacho Havacham, Pranasya Pranaha, Chakshushas Chakshu, Atimuchadira Pretyasma Lokad Amrita Bhavanti. Those people who are able to understand that God is not up there in the clouds. God is not far away beyond the universe. God is not unreachable, untouchable, un inconceivable, though God is all of this. God is that power that is very, very close to us, very intimate, the closest entity to us, because God is that which is the ear of the ear. You understand, Mon? When you hear a sound, like we heard just now, or you're hearing right now, your focus can be on that which you are hearing, then you're an extroverted person. Or it could shift to that wonderful divine power that enables me to hear. And then you're in a state of constant ecstasy irrespective of whether you're hearing good things or bad things, whether someone is praising you or abusing you, it doesn't matter. Shrutrasya Shrutram Manaso Manaha It's the mind of the mind. Pranasya Pranaha It is that power which enables your heart to beat consistently throughout your life. It is that which makes your lungs function brilliantly. What a fabulous way the exchange of gases takes place so that you're kept uh, rejuvenated and vitalized every moment of your life. Every cell in your system gets this energy and vitality. So while your daily activities are going on, you're contacting the world, you're hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, you're doing all kinds of interactions with the world. Whereas earlier your focus was on the world and that which you're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, feeling, or thinking, comprehending. Now your focus shifts to that one power that enables me to see, hear, smell, taste, touch, the rest of it. So instantly, from the diversity that you're experiencing now, it becomes dualistic, which means the, there is the experiencer, you experiencing the whole world, and then it focus, focus shifts completely to that unity, that one force that enables you to do everything. This is called open-eyed meditation. This is true knowledge. This is true jnana. For this, 
You don't need to study the Gita. Now don't say, why have you wasted our time for the last five days? There are people who have reached this exalted state of open-eyed meditation without having mastered the scriptures. And there are people who have mastered the scriptures. Chaturvedi. I hope there is no Chaturvedi here. Chaturvedi means one who has mastered all the four Vedas, but they are still rooted in, on earth. This capacity is called true jnana. And he continues in the Kenopanishad by saying, Tadeva Brahmatvam Vidhi. That alone is Brahman. What? That power that enables you to see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Not this which you people are worshipping. What are you worshipping? You're worshipping an idol in a temple. You're going to a place of pilgrimage. You're going here, there, and everywhere. Everywhere looking for God. God is not out there. It's within you every moment, every second, enabling you, facilitating all your activities. So while the activities are going on, shift your focus to that which enables you to do all this and you're instantly in the highest state of meditation. So meditation is not just sitting and repeating a mantra. Meditation is the capacity to focus on the divine aspect while the mundane activities are going on. For this, you need to study the Gita. This is it. So, in short, what have we been discussing for the last five days? Why is it that we're not able to do Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga and Jnana Yoga? Because our attention is constantly on one or two things that we don't have. Even right now as you're here, as on your way here, you could, may have complained about the traffic, you may have complained about um, bad drivers. You may have complained about parking. Correct. You may have complained about so many things. But when you're complaining about parking, you don't realize at least you have a car which has created the parking problem. So when your focus shifts to counting your blessings, then you get into payback mode because when you understand the millions of things that you have received in life, you would realize it's not worth looking at one or two things that you don't have. It's like if somebody gives you a birthday present and gives you an envelope with a board of notes and tells you a very generous gift, he says, you know, there's a lack of rupees in there. And I decided to give this to you as a gift so that you may use it to, for your betterment. You wanted to buy a, a new house or to furniture or whatever it is, this goes towards it. Promptly you go home and start counting. And then you realize there's 100 rupees short of 1 lakh. By mistake, the person who has given you the gift may have uh, counted wrongly and gave 100 rupee note less. What do you do? Do you ring him up and say, hey, are you, you said there was a lack there? He says, yes, of course. Why? Is there a problem? He says, no, there's 100 rupees short. So that man in his generosity says, oh, I'm so sorry, I'll send it to you immediately. And he sends it. But what do you think of a person who does this? You don't look at the fact that you have how much? 99,900. You look at 100 rupee note missing. This is our condition, much worse, much, much worse. What we have received is millions and trillions of things and you may not have one thing and that too is your imagination. So begin to count your blessings and when you count your blessings, you get into payback mode, you want to pay back through action. And that's called Karma Yoga. Bhakti Yoga is just feeling a sense of gratitude. It doesn't translate into action, but it's a very fine, subtle feeling of